you are a Canadian author living and in Australia and you are the winner of the literary award the Stella Prize. You just wrote a book called The Erratics, a memoir about the declining health and death of your mother. And I find it such an interesting subject because many of us have an unhealthy relationship with our parents and we don't know where we fit in. Are we the abnormal ones? Are there other the abnormal ones? Can anyone be in a worse situation than we are? And your book gives us that perspective. Yes, they could be we could be in a worse situation. <laughs> so uh, I find your book dark and humorous at the same time. And it's just I'm just so delighted to have you in the show. So, Vicky, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Ola. I'm very pleased to be here. So, I, I don't know how you pull it off, Vicky, of having such a dark subject as the decline of the health of your mother, her death, and in between the lines, you managed to sneak in some humor and, and levity to the subject. So, uh, yeah, congratulations on that. Of course, the listeners don't know what we are talking about. So I wonder, first of all, if you could tell us a little bit of your background story. I know we know that you are Canadian, but tell us a little bit about what you do, your profession, uh, in a summary, on to, let's say, now that you decided to write this book. Mm -hmm. Well, I've been retired for 10 years. Um, I was born in Montreal, and my father was in the armed services during the Second World War. He was stationed on the Atlantic coast, and my mother went down to be closer to him, and I was born in Montreal. Uh, so I have a soft spot in my heart for Montreal, even though I can't say I remember it from that very small time. Um, I grew up in the west of Canada. My father was an oil man. He built pipelines, so we moved a lot across the prairies, Calgary, Regina, Edmonton, and the little towns in the south of Alberta in the foothills. Uh, so I grew up as a small child in the foothills landscape, which I very much loved. Um, my mother was a French speaker, so I spoke both languages. And when I'd finished my first uni degree, I went to France to study, and I ended up staying in France for 25 years. I finished my studies over there, and I got married. I had children, and I worked. And um, in 1988, my ex-husband and I decided to move to Australia. And uh, I've been here ever since. So I've spent basically a, a third of my life on each of three different continents. Wow. I was an academic and a translator. I was also a business editor in France. Even though my studies were literary, I was an 18th century specialist. But I didn't want to be an academic when I first finished my studies. Uh, so I did other things, and I became a translator for a number of years. When I moved here, I was an academic for 20 years, and I enjoyed that very much. And wow. I retired, and um, I was not quite retired when my mother broke her hip. She was in her 90s. I hadn't seen my parents for many years because my mother was mentally ill, and she had... Um, kind of isolated herself and my father from everyone on a property in the country, uh, south of Calgary. And she didn't wish to see us. My sister lives in Canada, was closer, made more immediate kind of tries at contacting them. It was very difficult with my mother. My father would have, but my mother was pulling the strings. So when my mother broke her hip, um, we were contacted by someone outside the family to tell us that our father was ill also and needed help. So we went. And I hadn't seen a lot of my sister for many years either because I lived in France and then in Australia. And the distances are huge. So, as you would know, and uh, it makes things difficult for families. But those six years between when my mother broke her hip when I started going regularly to Canada and meeting my sister, 
who did the donkey's share of the work. I mean, she was closer, so she did much more than I did, but I would go two or three times a year and stay for several weeks and try to help and try to help from afar, but it was more difficult from that point of view. Um, those six years were very strange because I was plunged back in my parents' life. I got to know my sister again. And while a lot of what we were doing was very sad and sometimes quite traumatic, there were also moments that were extremely funny because my parents had got themselves in some very strange situations. And my mother told fantastic stories. I mean, she didn't know how to distinguish between reality and what she wanted to be reality. So um, we were always trying to unwind those threads. And I'll never forget the look on one banker's face when we went to a meeting. And this particular person had thought, that there'd been one child who died many, many years before when she was very little. And my sister walked in and introduced herself. And then the woman was just getting over that. And she said, well, let me introduce my sister. And I came in. <laughs> and people were, I think their first impulse was not to believe me or to believe my sister. They couldn't believe. My mother was a very good storyteller. So they believed her. I mean, she was believable, even though she told fantastic stories. So I thought it was worth writing all this down, and I did. And I don't usually uh, try to publish anything. I've always written, either in my profession or for myself over many, many years. I've always written. But um, I like to write. I don't think much about doing anything with it. So this was kind of a quirk. And um, here I am <laughs> talking to you in Montreal. <laughs> Great. OK, so we will come back to, to that, uh, how you came about to publish this book in a minute. But uh, first of all, uh, the name of your book is The Erratics. Can you tell us what that means? Uh, well, it's a very nice word. I mean, it, as an adjective, if you say someone or something is erratic, it means you just don't know what they're going to do. It's unpredictable and disorganized. And that was kind of the way our childhood was and my mother's life was uh, and my father's by the same occasion. But also in Alberta, from Alaska, down the inside of the Rocky Mountains and down into Montana, there are a series of very large, well, they're bigger than boulders. They're quite big. They're hundreds of feet long and tall, which were deposited by a glacier that came down many, many centuries ago. And it would melt a little bit and it would deposit one of these huge rocks on the prairies where there's no other geological formation. It was just carried down by the snow and the ice and then it melted and got stuck there. And the series of those, one every three or 400 miles, basically, is called the Foothills Erratic Train. It's the geological name for them. They're called erratics, I guess, because they don't belong in the landscape where they find themselves. And when I saw a sign pointing to the one which is near Okotoks, near where my father's property was, and it said, visit the Okotoks erratic, I thought, she was. that's a really good description of my mother. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it struck me that that was a, a good title <laughs> great and can you describe i mean we get a sense that your mother has always been a manipulator I, I, and i will give a moment you describe her as a, a flesh uh a flesh and blood a, pon a pyramid scheme a ponzi scheme herself so uh, can you describe a little bit of your early relationship with your mother if any of this manipulation and tyranny came across when you were a younger person? Oh, I think it was always there because I don't, my mother had what is called a personality disorder, um, which is much more serious on the scale of mental affliction. There are many ways you can be mentally unhinged and extremely unhappy, but this is one of the really, really bad ones because 
the connection with reality is distorted. My mother did not know what reality was. And from what people who know these things have told me, um, it's a very common characteristic not to have any empathy for other people and not to actually recognize their existence on the same level as yours. And I believe that's exactly what happened with my mother. Um, she had two children, me and my sister, but I don't think until we were pretty much grown up that she recognized us as being separate from her. So she always had an agenda for us. We needed to do very well at school. We needed to do a number of things she wanted, but it was as though those accomplishments were hers because she didn't really see us as separate people. And I always was in that situation when I went to school, I think that's when I began to see that not everyone lived that way. And I very quickly understood that my mother was very different. I mean, we were relatively isolated as a family because we moved a lot. My dad was building pipelines, so we'd move every year, every 18 months. So we weren't part of the fabric of any given community but I also came to realize that there was another reason why we were not part of the normal life of a place, you know, because my mother just, she could not do that. Right, but you, uh, I mean, one thing is having a mother that is a little bit weird, and the other thing is having this desire to, as soon as you are legally capable, to get away from home. So, can you describe some of those circumstances that make it made it unlivable that you just had to get out of there as fast as you could? Well, I'll tell you a story. Um, I mean, I was very tired in high school because I was also doing a lot of music. My mother was a very good musician, and she wanted me. Um, to either study music or French. Um, and I was doing music with the conservatory during my high school, so I wasn't sleeping a lot. I was working very hard. I was taking every course on the curriculum at high school because that was demanded of me. I managed to stay afloat, but um, it was very hard. And I realized that this... You know, I was 17, I was beginning to think, I, what's going to happen now? I'm going to go to uni, but, and I enrolled, I lived in Calgary with my parents, and I enrolled in the University of Calgary first year. And it was a new campus, then it was quite small, I know it's big and beautiful now. And my mother, who had never had occasion to go to university when she was a young person, decided the right time to do that was the year that I enrolled also. So she went to university the same year I did. We have the same first name. Our first name is Jacqueline. And her name is Jacqueline Yvonne, and mine is Jacqueline Victoire. And so there were two of us with this very similar name. My mother is a very flamboyant person. She decided lots of things at uni were not being run the way they should be. She just took the place apart. And I was just there as a freshman, just thinking, this is supposed to be a good experience, and this is absolute torture. So um, I got myself into the honors program, and the next year I moved to Edmonton because I thought I cannot do this. You know, it was just, it was weird beyond imagining, and I was always, I felt like I was a kind of a fireman walking around putting out spot fires, you know? And I had no time to be the person I wanted to be. Mm. I was just somebody who was trying to explain who this mad lady was who was taking the place apart and why I was related to her. <laughs> wow. And I was very tired of doing that. It had funny moments, but from the point of view of someone at an age when you're trying to become autonomous and, and find your place in the world, which is hard enough at the best of times, um, this was awful, you know. So I left, I went to Edmonton, I finished my degree there, and then I moved to France, and I basically never came back. But the regret I have is that my sister is six years younger. So when I left, um, she was 12, 
and there was no way I could get her out of there, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that was for her something quite difficult, you know? Wow. And there was okay. very little I could do. Wow. And and your mother also uh, was slowly killing your father and manipulating everything that he he yes. did, uh, or starving him to death. Can you share with us what was going on there as well? Yes. Well, look, I mean, that wasn't happening when I was going to uni. That's many, many decades ago. But um, in the early 2000s, when this hospitalization of my mother happened, we hadn't, I mean, we realized that my father was extremely thin. He was very confused when we spoke to him. I mean, he knew we were his daughters, but he was pretty foggy on what was going on. And I thought perhaps he had dementia. He didn't. Um, and I thought perhaps he had some kind of terminal illness. And we hadn't been told because he was very thin. As it turned out over the years preceding that, or maybe not, well, maybe a couple of years, we never knew exactly, but he hadn't been eating very much. My mother had just kind of, I don't know how to put it, I guess she was basically starving him. And when she went into hospital and my sister and I came and stayed with him on the property for several weeks, we made meals and he began to eat properly and sleep properly and um, turned into a different person. He put on a lot of weight and we realized that they'd just been isolated there. And basically for whatever reason, she had, she was very thin at this point too. Um, so maybe she was doing the same thing to herself. I mean, it was very hard to know, but they certainly were not eating properly, you know, and he was extremely thin. It was, I don't think if she had not broken her hip that they would have lasted very long because they were in their 90s. You know? Wow, wow. Yeah. And and why why did your mother went to the trouble of this this herring thing you and uh, and also your father you uh, i mean it was there like a bad feeling when you left and she hated you and she went to the trouble to make sure you don't get any inheritance well i think the thing is that when i left she had to recognize that i wasn't part of her mm. that she couldn't manipulate me and i don't think she'd seen me that way before And I believe that probably the only way she could explain that to herself was to consider that I was somehow a negative thing, something she needed to get rid of, you know, because I wasn't bringing her any satisfaction anymore. I was out living my own life. So I think she was just, I think it was kind of a, a wound for her to think this was my part of me and this has gone away, you know. And she couldn't see it. Yeah, she couldn't see it any other way except something malicious on my part. And it wasn't, you know. So I think that's what happened, although I can't speak to her state of mind because I am very lucky not to have known that kind of mental turmoil that my mother was in. But from what people who know these things have told me, That was probably why she became so very negative towards me and towards my sister. And a lot of older people, too, get very suspicious of their children and their grandchildren. I've heard tales of this from other families where very old people start thinking that their children are trying to bump them off to get the, hair, you know, the inheritance, even when there's basically no inheritance. It seems to be something that comes with very great age sometimes, you know, and probably a little bit of mental deterioration which my mother didn't have i mean not age related she was never demented um so there was perhaps a bit of that but basically i think it was a narcissistic thing she couldn't recognize that she had children who were grown up and who were living their own lives because her satisfaction had come from making those children do things for her wow Okay, so you were lucky enough to build some distance between you and your mother. I mean, you went to the other extreme of the globe. 
uh, but there are kids who are still living or are close to their narcissistic parents. I wonder if you have any tips for people who live with narcissists or close to deal with their narcissistic parents uh, regularly. Well, I certainly wouldn't presume to give anyone any tips because I just stumbled through most of my life in the best way I could figure out to do it. Uh, and I'm not a health professional, but um, I mean, I did when I was in my 20s, I chose the solution, which was great distance. And basically, I live in Sydney in Australia, where today it is about 100 degrees outside and very humid. And I'm sure that sounds very strange to you. Uh, it's a very, very warm day here. Um, and you can't get much farther away from Western Canada than I am here, which I now very much regret because I do love Western Canada, all of Canada. But um, so I chose to go distance. My sister stayed in Canada and I don't think she was tempted to go anywhere else. And she over the years had men, made many overtures, had visited my parents when that was still possible and tried very hard to have a different kind of accommodation, which was by accepting differences and and being patient and various things. But neither of our approaches worked very well because mm. these are extreme mental conditions. It's not, I think everyone is narcissistic. I mean, it's a normal thing when you're a small child. If you weren't, you wouldn't survive. And when you're socialized, you get to temper that, you learn that there are other people, you feel empathy for other people. Um, but you go through a narcissistic stage when you're a toddler. I mean, that's how it is. It's all about you. And then you grow and you mature. Some people don't. The very rare cases like my mother, they don't. So there's a difference between just being a narcissist, which is a painful thing to live with, and to be the extreme where my mother was, which is an actual psychiatric disorder. I, I think a narcissist is a very hard person to be in a relationship of any kind with, but there is no relationship at all possible with someone who has narcissistic personality disorder. It just simply cannot be done. Wow. So okay. You are with it. So I have no tips to offer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, you help us put things in perspective. Yes, yes, to know your life experience. Oh, please consult your health professional because <laughs> really I am not one of them. Right. Okay. So let's talk about the creation of this book. So you say that you have always written, uh, but this book has been very well received. You got a, a, a nice literary award and your book has hundreds of positive reviews in, in Amazon and I don't know where else. But for someone who who is not hasn't been a professional author to come out out of the gate and have such a nice piece of work. Can you tell us what's the process, how you came up with the idea to write this book, and then how do you get it, get it to the market? Well, um, yes, I mean, it sounds in disingenuous to say that I really did not expect any of this to happen, but that is absolutely true. This is the first book I have published. Um, I was very busy with my professions when I was working. Um, I belonged to a writing group for a long, long time, for a couple of decades more now. Um, so I've always been very interested in the process. And 20 some years ago, I was writing short fiction. I was writing short stories. Uh, that was a focus. Then I wrote a lot of poetry and I got interested in memoir, but I was doing this just for myself, you know, not for, I didn't ever consider myself to be a writer and I didn't have the, that wasn't an ambition, it wasn't a focus, I was doing other things. And I think that when I retired, I had a little more time. And so I wrote a bit more 
And there's a wonderful place here near Sydney called Varuna. It's a writer's house. It belongs, used to belong to a novelist called Eleanor Dark and her husband, who was a general practitioner, a doctor. And it's in the Blue Mountains, about two hours east, west of Sydney, west. And um, in a kind of a semi-mountainous region. And it's a beautiful house. It has five guest bedrooms. And for a week at a time, five writers can go there. There are no television sets, no radios. You have to turn your phone off. You just work all day. Dinner is made for you in the evening and you sit with the other writers and you talk. Sometimes in the evening you can read each other things you've written if you want to. Uh, it's absolutely heaven. And um, I got a newsletter from this house called Varuna one night when I couldn't sleep and they were having what they called a memoir focus week. And I had this book, it had been in a drawer for two years. And I thought, well, maybe I should see if that's the way it should stay or, you know, so I got it out and I applied and I got a place, which I didn't expect. So I went up there for a week and I had a cons what they call a consultant. It was a wonderful writer who also lived in Canada um, called Carol Major and her sister. Alice is the poet laureate of Alberta right now. She lives in Edmonton. So there was a Canadian connection and she liked the manuscript very much. And she said, you must send it somewhere. So that was the impetus. I never would have otherwise. I was just interested in working on it a little bit, having had some distance from it, I'd put it away, which I think is always a good thing to do when you've finished writing something. You put it away for a while and let it marinate and see how it comes out in a, in a while. But I'd just left it in a drawer for almost two years. Wow. So I did, I entered it in a competition called the Finch Memoir Competition, which Finch Publishing was a small independent publishing house down here. And I won that prize. Then Finch um, closed its doors about six months later. So then I transferred to another publisher and um, it went from there. Now it's um, in North America, which I'm very pleased about. I think that's its natural landscape. I'm happy that it's out there. Wow, great. And so now that you have these recognitions and and you have proven yourself as a as a good writer, do you have any plans in for the future? Are you planning to continue writing or was this like oh, a one? I continue writing, yes, all the time. Um, I didn't plan this as a book. You know, it, it still amazes me to look at it and think, goodness me, it's a book. And it's got different covers in different countries. And, you know, it's it's just lovely for me to look at this and think it's actually a thing. You know, it's it's amazing. But um, but for me, the satisfaction is actually just sitting with my page and trying to get things right on the page, you know. So I write poetry. I found this COVID year very difficult to focus and to do things. I do have a project um, to write about my grandfather who was an interest, my mother's father, actually, which may turn out to be very significant, I suppose, um, who said he was an immigrant from France to the US when he was a child. And in fact, that wasn't true. Um, he was actually a member of the Métis population in, from the Red River District in Canada. And uh, so my fourth great-grandfather was a man called uh, Cuthbert James Grant, who was one of the Métis leaders during the rebellion period with Louis Riel. And um, there are some very, very interesting people there. And my grandfather had hidden that because of, for reasons of prejudice, one presumes. I mean, I've, I'll never know exactly, but he did a very good job of pretending he was someone else. So I want to think a lot about that. And I was planning to go to Canada this last year, maybe in September. That obviously did not happen and try to go to the various places um, where he was born in North Dakota and where he lived and, and to try to meet people who are part of that extended family that I never knew I had 
until a few years ago, my daughter did some research online and found this information. It was something I'd never done because that's only been available for a certain number of years. And my generation doesn't have the reflex to go on the family history sites and start looking. And I've been kind of busy. So I hadn't, but it's very fascinating to see what information is available. And I would like to do something with that. This last year, I found that getting things done and motivating yourself has been a difficult thing for many people. And I've felt quite scattered in my application to things too. I mean, hopefully now we may focus a bit better. I hope so. Who knows? Okay, one, one last question. Have you gotten any feedback from readers in regards to your book and maybe their relationship with their own mothers? Uh, had anyone approached you and told you if the, your story applies to them? Well, this has been one of the most satisfying things uh, because I've done events at writers' festivals and book signings and things of that nature. And I've had many people come to me and say, you've written my story, which surprised me because I'm kind of a hermit. I stay at home and I write stuff. Um, and I hadn't realized, I mean, it sounds dumb, but I had actually not realized how universal a theme this was, the difficulties between generations, even without severe mental illness. There's always friction. There are always things that don't work. There's, you know, sibling rivalry and, and parents who, you know, I mean, when you start digging in your own family, you find the most surprising stories and all families are the same. And I hadn't, well, not the same, but the same mechanisms are there, you know, to a greater or letter, lesser extent. It's all a question of how supportive the upbringing of the children manages to be, how you come out. Um, but so many people said those things to me. And one young man said to me at one event, uh, he said, I've got similar problems in my family and they're difficult. And he said, I've felt less alone since I read your book. And that's one of the most precious things for me is to remember that lovely young man in his business suit saying this to me obviously making a really good go of it out there in the world. He was doing fine, but he must have been in his 20s and he had this thing he was carrying to and trying to deal with. And he said he felt less alone for having read my book. And I thought I didn't start out to do that. But the fact that people have said things of that nature to me is just a wonderful privilege. I feel amazingly good that something I wrote may have brought a little bit of comfort to someone. Wow, Vicky. Okay, so Vicky, the last question is, oh, is for you to please tell us one more time the name of your book and where can people find it? Okay, I've just gone and got one before I spoke to you, so I'm going to show you the book. Here it is with the beautiful Canadian cover. I love this cover. It's lovely. A snow scene. Um, it's called The Erratics. It's a memoir. And there we are. Try to hold it straight. And um, I'm delighted that it's available in Canada and the U.S. because that's the landscape. The landscape is a character in the book. And it's, it's in the landscape it should be in. And I'm very pleased about that. Well, okay. Well, we asked the listeners if they can to go and ask your local bookseller in your little town to to get it for you and then of course if they don't have it and if they cannot get it then to try amazon <laughs> well i don't know what to suggest because i have no idea how that works i think it's um i have heard from people in canada friends that i haven't heard of anything of for decades who have written to me and said that they have found the book and uh so it's it's probably in a library somewhere <laughs> <laughs> perfect, perfect. Vicky, thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you, Ella. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you so much. <laughs>